everyone. This is, uh, my name is Matthew Carlisle. I work at uh, Luxoft, which is a 10,000 employee system integrator. Uh, I work at the IoT division, which is based out of uh, Washington State. And uh, we focus on a couple things, mainly uh, our IoT practice and secondarily big data, which as you all know is a, a large part of IoT. So they tend to overlap a lot, but I run the architecture team for the IoT practice. Uh, today we're going to talk about intelligence at the edge, which is a hot topic these days. Uh, it's about putting intelligence on devices at the edge. Um, actually ties in quite nicely with uh, B-Square's presentation they just made regarding data collection and processing. So let's go ahead and get started. So first we'll talk about the current model. Uh, and I'm going to use a specific example. Uh, and the example is a, a Raspberry Pi device, which is a, a relatively powerful edge sensor, a uh, little Linux box running an ARM processor, and it's collecting humidity data at a fairly high frequency. You know, it could be a couple times a second, 10 or 100 times a second. And that data would typically go up to the cloud. In, in this example's case, it's going up to AWS. The data is ingested, um, processed in some kind of processing engine. I'm, I'm using Apache Spark, which is a Hadoop-based uh, processing engine. And we might use some data models that we've created. We might uh, do some machine learning. And of course, we might be storing all of that data for later processing. And finally, once the data has potentially passed a threshold, humidity is fluctuating, or some other threshold is reached, then um, we actually may send a message or act on that data. And in other examples you've seen from other companies, um, like B-Square and other, other examples, the rules engine in the cloud will actually generate action to happen on the device. So the cloud is involved in the whole process end to end, and then something might happen on the device. For example, um, in this case, you may you may send a command back to the device to regulate the humidity in some way. So we have a thing we talk about called the insight to terabyte ratio. And that's really about what, you know, what's the volume of insights I'm getting for how much I'm storing. And our perspective is that the, the prevailing wisdom um, is that you just collect it all and then analyze and act later in the cloud. Um, there seems to be a lot of talk about how much data is coming off devices, the 787, Boeing, and Boeing 787, and so on, and terabytes of data coming in. Let's just collect it all and then deal with it later. Um, we think this is difficult and it's expensive for certain communication models, such as cellular, um, especially when you're dealing with high frequency data. And I think importantly, what you don't get is the ability to act autonomously on the data that's come in. You can't, at the edge, act on the data. Um, you can't do something with it because you're reliant on the cloud to process, ingest, run some rules, and so on. So finally, and the important part of the ratio is that the insights terabyte ratio is low. You've got terabytes, petabytes of data, and really you're not generating a lot of insights. And, and importantly, you're generating insights in the cloud, which, which is seen to be valuable and certainly valuable, but uh, we think there's an alternative. And this alternative is something that's getting fairly popular these days. It's a bit of a hot topic. Um, and that's moving the intelligence to the edge, to the data collection endpoint, or to a gateway that's running um, you know, at the edge. So what you might do, and, and this is something that's been done for a while because you really have to with high frequency devices, aggregate and filter the data at the point of collection. If you're generating 100 data points a second, you might just take averages, standard deviations, and so on, pretty basic stuff. And then that allows you to send much data, much less data to the cloud. Uh, that's very important for cellular devices, which uh, we think is going to be uh, more prevalent uh, kind of rollout in the future because getting devices hooked up to Wi-Fi or other local area networks can be tricky and from an IT perspective, it can be very awkward. And importantly, I think the critical point is you can act locally. We mentioned this before. Um, you can't act locally on processed data if all you're doing is collecting it to, and sending it to the cloud and waiting for the cloud to tell you to do something. So you may use basic models, which are the kinds of things that are in place today, such as uh, the, uh, the smoothie machine that needs to know a temperature is below a certain amount, and then it does something very basic. Or you might want to use more advanced models. Um, we think the more advanced models is, is what's going to be happening. Everyone talks about machine learning. And so we think that if you can move machine learning processing out to the device, uh, then you can do more complicated things, and you can act on that data quickly. So let's talk about the challenges of that, because if this is very obvious, then I think everyone will be doing it now. 
Um, the first challenge we think is the increased computational requirement. There's a lot of devices out there that really don't have a lot of computing power. You've got 64 kilobytes of RAM. You have a no, you don't have Linux running on it. You have a very basic RTOS running on the device. So the solutions, I mean, first optimize. That's always the first solution. Then you just buy faster hardware. I mean, that's the easy, just throw money at the solution. That's very difficult when it comes to washing machines. Um, and then the third solution is to kind of wait. Moore's law will fix it. In two to five years, even a washing machine is going to have a, a dual core processor on it, and it'll cost five bucks. So making generated models operational. So a lot of model creation is done in the cloud. You have data scientists running statistical algorithms, machine learning. But how do you take that and actually deploy it at the edge? We think, we think trying to align on the tool set is important here. If you have data scientists working with Spark and um, you know, programming in Python and R, then on the cloud, then it would be easier to deploy those solutions if you could then use similar tool sets, if not the same tool sets, at the edge. That way you're not having to transfer your models from your data science organization to your embedded software organization and get them recoded in C, and maybe they don't work, maybe they do work. It's very difficult to, to run those kinds of solutions. So as an example, use Linux, Java, Apache Spark, and machine learning as one example of what you might do both in the cloud and on the device. Essentially managing and updating those models. There's no point in being able to update your models and have data scientists work in the cloud if it's not easy to deploy those updated models out to your devices. Doing firmware updates um, in a monolithic fashion to the field is, is difficult and it's risky and it's something that, that tends to be avoided. If you are generating a new machine learning algorithm every week, like a Netflix might be doing, for example, then how do you get that model out to the device every week so that you can actually gain benefit from it? Um, so solutions using the cloud to push updates to devices, um, using non-monolithic software approach, which is obviously how it is on smartphones and has been for quite a while. Let's talk about apps and, and using uh, interpreted code, running on JVMs, Java, and, and even using scripting languages like Python. This reduces the risk once you deploy your models and software out to the, to the devices. So how might this particular prototype work in that kind of solution? So in this example, you have a Raspberry Pi, um, and it's locally processing the high frequency data and then acting on it locally. It's doing aggregates, it's applying a model to that data on the actual Raspberry Pi, and then once the model says that something has happened, the humidity is fluctuating, then it can either act locally, or in this case, it could just send the alert up to the cloud rather than sending all the data and making the cloud do the alert. So it ends up being the same result in this particular example, that you get a notification on your phone um, or that the humidity is an issue, for example. But of course, critically, you can act locally on the left of that diagram and do something about the humidity, even without the cloud being involved, which is important for environments in which connectivity is troubling. Um, it's up or down, you're running on cellular. So let me give a, a brief example. So. For those out there that have run Apache Spark, it's, it's typically run on clusters. You typically would deploy Apache Spark on a Hadoop cluster with several fairly high power servers, either in the cloud or on premise. It's not the kind of thing that you immediately think I'm going to go put on a Raspberry Pi. Um, it's, uh, it's a lot of processing power. And so we may be looking at something that's a couple of years out or needs to be significantly optimized for the embedded platforms. So here is actually the, the Raspberry Pi. Uh, the, the, sorry about the resolution here. What we've done with this Raspberry Pi is 3D print a, a basic little case for it. I took the top off so I could show you. And we have a humidity sensor here and uh, a bunch of other sensors as well. But I'm just using the humidity sensor that we uh, put on the board. It's running over Wi-Fi, but of course they run over Ethernet as well. Um, we've deployed Spark. And in fact, uh, we have the, the, log, the log for Spark is, is running there. You can see. You can see it's producing uh, aggregate data on a, on a five second batch. The way that Spark works is, is you define the batch. So you're going to take all the data in over a period, of, a period of time, and then you're going to every five seconds do something with that data. Like I say, you can aggregate the data like we're doing here, or you can apply all of that data through an algorithm and then get a result out, say a clustering algorithm or a neural networking alg algorithm of, of some kind. So let's take a look at this running. This uh, kind of relying on a, a local network here. So. If I hit refresh, 
if the demo gods are on my side, what we should see is that Spark running on this device, it's running a little web server, which is one of the other reasons it's a fairly high power requirement, and it's actually processing the real-time data coming in, and, uh, and as you can see, we're talking about a processing time of about two seconds per batch, and it's fairly stable. Um, in terms of computational requirements, this is using several megabytes of RAM. It is not something you're going to put on a small device, um, but it is also not optimized. I've basically downloaded Apache Spark from the internet and put it on this device. I've not done anything to make it smaller, and, uh, and I've not done anything that would really make it particularly optimal for this platform. But uh, as you can see, as is, you can download Spark. This device has Java on it, and you can just run it and collect data locally and do something with that data. So. Let me go, go back in here. Can't actually see what I'm typing. I'm going to log into the device and show you how much power it's using to give you an example of, uh, of exactly what it's doing. So you, what you'll see is that we're using a fair amount of RAM. This device has a gigabyte of RAM. So it is, as I said, it is not a washing machine. But it is indicative of the kinds of devices that you get out in the field for your heavier industrial appliances. We work with John Deere, and they have a device on their combine harvesters that is actually more powerful than this. It's a dual core 400 megahertz device running Linux. So it is a typical gateway device, I would say, but it's not a typical sensor device. And like I say, unmodified, it's using a decent amount of memory, a lot of memory, let's be honest, and, um, and occasionally it's using a good amount of CPU. But the point is, it's possible. And I think that in a couple of years, what we'll see is more devices in the field be able to actually run these kinds of solutions. Um, we're probably talking in the one to five year range, and we'll be able to run tools that we typically would run on the cloud, and we'll be able to deploy them out to the field and make it easier to deploy those models in a more automated fashion. So that pretty much wraps up my talk. Um, we are over, Luxoft is over at booth 314. We, as I say, are a system integrator. We typically don't do a lot of device work. We work with companies that have devices, like John Deere and a company called Vantage Power in the UK, and they need somewhere to send that data to. Um, but what we like to do is stay informed about what's possible on devices so that we can properly integrate cloud solutions um, with the device. And this is the kind of prototyping that we'll do occasionally just to kind of figure that out and make sure we stay on top of the industry. So. Thank you very much for your time. Come by and see us when you get a second.